very exciting to be at a venue where there has to be so much security <laughs> on the front door. It's quite, it's kind of thrilling, in a slightly kind of um, peculiar way. Uh, and thank you for describing me as distinguished. That was very nice as well. So I'm, I'm liking it here already. It's good. Um, early, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to give some talks uh, in America, uh, in the Midwest, and I uh, started off in Chicago and uh, ended up in Indianapolis. Uh, and a bit like tonight, you know, wherever I went, the publicity that had arrived ahead of me um, always described me as one of the leading Jewish dissident voices on Israel, Palestine and Britain. And every time I stood up, I always felt like I had to say to them, um, you know, it's really not that difficult to be one of the leading British <laughs> dissidents on Israel, Palestine, because um, it's quite a small field. Um, although I'm pleased to say it's getting bigger. Um, so just to be absolutely clear, in case anyone is uh, confused on this point, uh, you are not hearing from a mainstream Jewish voice. Um, I am not typical, I'm not representative. Um, I have to keep saying this because I think the Board of Deputies sometimes think that I am sort of putting myself out there as some kind of alternative chief rabbi, um, and, I'm, and I'm not. Um, so if, uh, if they're watching this video later, okay, I've made it absolutely clear, just looking at the camera now. Okay. Um, it's why I call the monthly blog that I write uh, on the Patheos website, Writing from the Edge. Uh, the Board of Deputies, uh, the formal body which claims to represent uh, the Jewish community in this country, is, is not keen on my work. Uh, but then I'm not that keen on their work either, so <laughs> that's kind of fair. Uh, the Chief Rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, is not uh, an avid reader of my blog either. Um, I've spoken to many gatherings around the country, and I thank you for having me in Brighton tonight, uh, where I know you're a very busy um, and active group and you've got some interesting local adversaries um, in the area as well. Um, but I'm yet to receive a single invitation from a mainstream Jewish organisation to speak. Um, and yet, to speak in a synagogue um, is really what I would like to do. Because when I started writing on this issue, it was other Jews that I wanted most to speak to. And I think that tells you something about the limits of acceptable discourse on Israel within the Jewish community today um, that I've yet to get uh, anything like that kind of invitation. <coughs> uh, my original blog was called Micah's Paradigm Shift, which gives uh, you another clue as to where I'm coming from on all of this. Some of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the Hebrew prophets of the Old Testament, uh, Micah, Amos, Jeremiah, uh, and the biggest name of all, Isaiah. They began a long tradition of Jewish descent, uh, a tradition of speaking truth to power and calling for justice and righteousness without fear of the consequences. Now you could say that the prophets of the Hebrew Bible were the original self-hating Jews, and um, that's not uh, my description of the moment. What's brilliant about Judaism is that we kept the prophets within the scriptural canon. Uh, we didn't edit them out, um, and now it's far too late. Um, thankfully, we are stuck with them. Uh, and that's very good news for me uh, and a growing number of Jews around the world who now realise that speaking truth to power once again means speaking up against our own Jewish leadership and the government of the Jewish State of Israel. My own take on Judaism and my attempt to find meaning in the many tragedies experienced by the Jewish people throughout our history um, is shaped by that prophetic tradition. In fact, I'd go as far as saying, what's the point of being Jewish? What's the point of being alive to the message of Jewish history if you don't apply that distinctive Jewish voice for justice? Without what I like to call that Jewish edginess, why be Jewish at all? I do find myself having to say uh, more and more um, what I'm not. So here goes. I'm not anti-Semitic, although some people are happy to call me that. I'm not a self-hating Jew unless you think that Isaiah was as well. I don't want the destruction of Israel or a second holocaust or the Jews of Israel pushed into the sea. Nor do I believe that anything I say would lead to such outcomes. So what do I believe? I believe anti-Semitism exists. It's real. It always will be. But certainly in Britain there's a lot less of it than certain people want you to believe. I believe Jewish people have the right to self-determination 
that Jewish national self-determination is a whole different idea and it's deeply problematic. I believe there is a profound connection between Jews and the land of Israel that I'm not a Zionist, even of the moderate liberal variety. And sadly, not being Zionist puts you beyond the pale as far as most of the establishment Jewish leadership is concerned. Most importantly, I believe that our relationship to the Palestinian people is the defining relationship for Jews and Judaism in the 21st century. Tragically, the Jewish people have done a great wrong to the Palestinian people. That doesn't mean that every Jew is equally to blame for what's happened and what continues to happen to the Palestinians. But as one of my favourite rabbis of the 20th century, Abraham Joshua Heschel, was fond of saying, in a democracy, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And if we don't talk honestly about our relationship to the Palestinian people, why should anyone listen to Jewish voices on any other ethical issue of our age, particularly racism and discrimination and the plight of refugees? I hope that helps you to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, what I'm going to say next. Sip of water. Twenty eighteen has been a quite extraordinary year. <coughs> it's been heavy with anniversaries. Seventy years since the creation of the State of Israel, which meant seventy years since the start of the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians, which continues today. It was 25 years since the Oslo Accords were signed between Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat and the White House Lord. It's been the 10th anniversary of Israel's blockade of Gaza. We've had the Great March of Return, the protest at the Gaza fence by Palestinians reminding the world of the homes they were forced to flee in 1948. More than 200 of them have been killed by Israeli IDF snipers so far. Many, many thousands have been left injured. In the week that Israel was celebrating its founding, Donald Trump chose to keep his election promise of moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, he'd already recognized the entire city as the indivisible capital of the Jewish people, effectively calling time on one of the main principles of the two-state solution, that East Jerusalem would be the capital of a Palestinian state. Closer to home this summer, we've seen something I found quite um, incredible uh, and extremely disturbing. Uh, the accusations from the leadership of my Jewish community that the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, is anti-Semitic mm -hmm. and that anti-Semitism is rife among the party's half a million members. Um, I think the actions of the Board of Deputies and the Jewish Leadership Council and the editors of our Jewish communal newspapers have been foolish and irresponsible beyond measure. Mm -hmm. At best, they have unnecessarily created anxiety and fear within Jewish homes. At worst, they have drained anti-Semitism of meaning mm -hmm. while risking a backlash against the Jewish community if they ever succeeded in toppling Corbyn's leadership. And for the record, I'm not a member of the Labour Party, um, let alone a member of Momentum. So I'm in the library. Um, let me also say that anti-Semitism undoubtedly exists um, on the left um, as well as the right. Uh, and on the left, it always exists, nearly always, in the context of the debate over Israel and Zionism. And that has to be challenged, and Jeremy Corbyn <coughs> himself has acknowledged this many times now. However, I see no epidemic infecting those half a million Labour Party members. I certainly don't see an existential threat, as it was described by three Jewish newspapers over the summer. Uh, like Tony, um, I think this is really about Jeremy Corbyn himself. If Corbyn had not been a lifelong campaigner for Palestinian rights and a long-time critic of Israel, um, I don't think any of this would be happening. We certainly would not have had months of vilification against him and the endless twisting and distortion of his actions and words, always in relation to Israel-Palestine. And then last Saturday, we had 11 mostly elderly Jews shot dead while observing the Jewish Sabbath 
at their synagogue in Pittsburgh, thought to be the worst uh, attack on the Jewish community in North America. Uh, and there's much to say and observe about uh, the murders in the last seven days. Despite the political discourse created by the Board of Deputies and other Jewish leaders in the UK, it turns out that the literal existential threat to Jews comes from the far right, not the far left, especially when they have easy access to guns. The accused Robert Bowers appears to have had no interest in Israel or Palestinians. He targeted the Tree of Life synagogue because of its links to a venerable Jewish charity which helps refugees and immigrants coming to America. He saw Jews as outsiders, aiding and abetting the arrival of more outsiders and therefore destroying the American people, wherever he thinks the American people are. The most pro-Israel president probably ever, Donald Trump, doesn't make Jews safe in America. In fact, the opposite looks to be true. Trump's politics encourage the kind of divisiveness that puts any minority group, regardless of their social or economic success or their white skin, at risk. The last few days have also exposed the ever-widening schism between Israel and American Jewry. The Israeli chief rabbi said that he couldn't recognize the Tree of Life as a proper synagogue because it's not religiously observant enough. That's quite an insult to the six or seven uh, million American Jews who attend mostly reform and conservative denominations. Another example of being tone deaf to a community in grief was what was said by the leader of the Israeli Labour Party, Avi Gabay. He told American Jews that they should come and live in Israel, which is of course what Robert Bowers would also like to see happen to American Jews. This is how Zionism ends up handing a victory to anti-Semitism. Prime Minister Netanyahu then sends to Pittsburgh uh, one of his most right-wing, most anti-Arab, most anti-immigrant cabinet ministers, Neftali Bennett, who leads the Settler Party in Israel, uh, to show solidarity with liberal-minded American Jews. Bennett arrives in Pittsburgh and wastes no time in linking Hamas rockets to Bauer's bullets in a wildly ahistorical presentation of anti-Semitism. Uh, seemingly desperate to spread and model the blame for the murder of Jews in America to Palestinians and those who support them around the world. Netanyahu, of course, can't say a word against Donald Trump. They have far too much in common. And then a couple of days later, Netanyahu congratulates the latest extreme right politician on the block, the newly elected president of Brazil, who's promised to move his Israeli embassy uh, to Jerusalem. Last weekend on my own Facebook page, I found myself deleting comments and unfriending people and blocking others. As anything I posted about Pittsburgh, even a prayer for the dead, which I shared, became a platform to directly blame Netanyahu or Zionism for what had just taken place. Uh, which brings me um, uh, to Baroness Jenny Tung, uh, who you'll know is a patron of PSC. And I thought I couldn't come and talk to you tonight without mentioning this. Jenny made a true statement. Zionism and the actions of the State of Israel uh, do affect and create anti-Semitism around the world. Uh, even the Jewish Community Security Trust, the organization which monitors anti-Semitism, would have to agree with that. They know that anti-Semitic incidents spike when Israel attacks Gaza in the way that it has done in 2008, uh, and 2012, and 2014. Jenny made a truthful observation, but I would argue in the wrong context and at the wrong moment. That was unfortunate and to me disappointing from Jenny, but it was not a crime. I don't think it me makes her anti-Semitic. Uh, I'd agree with uh, Tony that Jenny should not have to resign as the PSC patron or be thrown out of the Lords uh, either. I also agree that there is a link between Zionist thinking and uh, Israel's behaviour and the global rise of intolerance and racism. However, I think it's important that the white supremacist anti-immigrant fascists in America are held directly accountable for the Pittsburgh murders. Zionism is part of the wider issue, but people need to take greater care in how they express this 
if they want to avoid being accused of anti-Semitism. As always, it's a minefield to navigate. Pittsburgh has become just the latest example of how talking about Jews and Israel and Zionism can quickly become full of heat and hate from multiple directions. I want to say a little about why Israel has become such an emotional issue for the Jewish community all around the world. Israel is not just a state, it's, it's an idea. An idea that's compelling and emotional for most Jewish people. It's an idea that the security of the state of Israel is an essential, necessary precondition for the survival of the Jewish people. And its existence is justified through the Jewish historical experience of discrimination and persecution that culminated in the Nazi Holocaust in the mid 20th century. Israel is now an idea that not only shapes but dominates Jewish identity today. It dominates far more than religious beliefs or observance of Jewish rituals or customs. Support for Israel has become an alternative Jewish religion for many secular Jews and central to Jewish self-understanding for most synagogue-going Jews, whether they are orthodox, reform or liberal. For religious Jews, Zionism has been successfully integrated into their theological understanding. That's what enables the chief rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, to describe Zionism as an axiom of Judaism. You, uh, I'm sure, will all know that Zionism began as a late 19th century political project. It was a reaction to the less than hospitable experience of Jews in Europe, thanks in considerable part to the anti-Jewish teaching of the church. And despite what the chief rabbi says, Zionism didn't really go mainstream for Jews until after the Holocaust. And you can't understand Zionism and Israel today without understanding Jewish history and the deep, deep hostility towards Jews in Europe for much of the last 2,000 years. I think it's far too easy to label Zionism simply as white European settler colonialism, although it's certainly that as well. I think it's wrong to imagine that every Jew that came to Palestine in the early decades of the 20th century was set on land theft and murder and ethnic cleansing. The same applies to the refugees from Europe who came there in the late 1940s, having survived the Holocaust. The vast majority of Zionist settlers in Palestine came in hope of a better life and a safer home than the one they had left or fled in Europe. The problem with Zionism was that the situation was not, as the popular slogan had had it, a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, it was a land full of indigenous Arabs, both Muslim and Christian. And it didn't take long for the early Zionist pioneers uh, at the turn of the 20th century to discover this as their writings and diaries reveal. By the 1940s, the dominant strain within Zionist thinking was the aim of creating a Jewish state with a Jewish majority as the only way to secure Jewish security. That put Zionism on a collision course with the majority non-Jewish people had been living on the land for more than a thousand years. Once Zionist thinking had coalesced around the idea of a majority Jewish state, the displacement of the Arab population one way or another and the ongoing discrimination against them was an inevitable outcome if Zionism was to succeed. Now I know I'm meant to be telling you about my personal journey to Palestinian solidarity, so let me share some of that with you. Um, Thirty years ago it was that my understanding of Israel began to change. I was in my final year at Manchester University and with my exams approaching, um, I should have been getting down to some serious um, academic work and revision. Um, John Locke and John Russo and J.S. Mill and Karl Marx were all demanding my serious attention. Uh, but instead I was using the university library to attempt to understand the outbreak of the first Palestinian Intifada. Uh, that uprising, uh, I'm sure many of you know, began in Gaza in December of 1987 uh, and quickly spread to the West Bank. Uh, and it was an uprising from the streets of occupied Palestine, provoked by frustration and disillusionment. And it was characterized by strikes and boycotts and civil disobedience, and most notably, children and young people throwing stones at armed 
Israeli soldiers. The first intifada was a modern day reworking of the David and Goliath story from the Bible. But this time, the Palestinian children were David and the Jewish soldiers were Goliath. And that was an unsettling role reversal for someone like me who'd been brought up on those Bible stories. Until the first intifada, I had a little sense of the Palestinian people as a community with a heritage and a history as close to them as mine was to me. But now they were no longer just terrorists pursuing a militant cause that I didn't really understand. Here was a people suffering in the West Bank and Gaza because of what my people were doing. Maybe if I'd walked up to the next floor and opened those books on Locke and Rousseau, Mill and Marx, they could have shed some light on the reasons for the first intifada. Rights, liberty, freedom, structures of oppression. Um, hadn't I spent three years studying these things? The first intifada for me was the start of a long journey of reading and reflection and finally encounters and conversations with Palestinians that's taken me to the place where I now stand. Now, I'm not going to take you through every twist and turn of that journey, but I will just sort of stop off at a couple of junctions. Israel's Operation Cast Lead against Gaza in uh, December 2008 and into 2009 uh, made me realise just how far I had already travelled from the community I came from when it came to Israel. Um, I used to get the Jewish Chronicle delivered by post uh, to our home in Kendall where we were living in those days. And although I knew that the paper had been kind of moving to the right on Israel for a few years, it wasn't until I was reading its reporting on, uh, on Gaza that I could tell how disconnected uh, I had become with the, uh, the mainstream Jewish communal narrative. The Jewish Chronicle's editorial line was adamant that every aspect of the military action was justified uh, and responsible and proportionate and ethical. Uh, the only people acting without morals were Hamas and all their Palestinian supporters. Um, and I just couldn't buy this story anymore. Um, it flew in the face of every other piece of information I was reading or seeing. According to the Israeli NGO, Beit Salem, uh, 1,391 Palestinians were killed on the Gaza Strip during Operation Cast Lead, of which 344, 344 were children. Uh, five Israeli soldiers were killed uh, and no Israeli citizens. Uh, that's not a war. Uh, that's not even a conflict. Um, it doesn't look much like self-defence either. Um, at the very least, it's the de definition of disproportionate. It was then that I realised I had no interest in ever returning uh, to Israel, and I've been a couple of times already by then, unless I could meet and talk to Palestinians. And it was a while before the opportunity arose, and it came thanks to a charity called Amos Trust, uh, which some of you may have heard of. Um, the trip that my wife uh, Anne and I made to Israel in the West Bank in 2011 was a turning point for me and the end point for my already very fragile connection to Zionism. Now you can read all the books you want, uh, and trust me, I've read a few, um, but nothing matches seeing things with your own eyes and talking to people face to face. And it was a, full, it was a trip full of uh, mind-blowing encounters. One day with Palestinian partners of Amos Trost, we sat beneath the, uh, the shade of a tree in a village of uh, Walajah near Bethlehem with volunteers who'd just been rebuilding a Palestinian home that had been deemed illegal by the Israeli authorities and then demolished. Uh, and the penny dropped for me that day that the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians was not what I thought it was. Uh, this was not a them and us situation. This was not two peoples fighting over one piece of land. That framing of the situation had no relation to the facts on the ground in the West Bank. For decades, the conflict has been not about competing national claims, it's been about those that have rights and those who don't. What I was hearing about and seeing for myself was land theft and settlement building, house demolitions, water appropriation, parallel judicial systems, arrest and detention without charge, children being regularly shot and maimed or killed by Israeli soldiers. And once you grasp this up close, it undermines much of the official Jewish narrative 
around the alleged peace process that calls for direct negotiations between the two sides as if they were equals, with equal standing, equal rights, equal negotiating power. They are not. There is no balance. There is no them and us. It's become a question of human rights and human wrongs. The question in my head from that moment on was where do I stand in such a situation? How does this make me feel as a British Jew? If it was only the situation in the West Bank and Gaza and annexed East Jerusalem that I thought was bad, um, I could still call myself uh, what's known as a liberal Zionist. But the real challenge to my Zionism was meeting Palestinian citizens of Israel within its 1967 borders. A few days after that realisation in the village of Walaja, our tour reached Nazareth, the largest Palestinian uh, majority town in Israel, where we met Samuel and Susan <coughs> uh, Samuel was then the vicar of Christ Church in Nazareth. And Susan and Samuel uh, are Palestinian Christians, Israeli citizens, his families have lived uh, in Israel, Palestine for generations. And the Bahums, without the slightest anger in their voices, told us what it meant to them uh, and their young children to be Palestinian citizens of Israel. Citizens who earn their living in Israel and pay their taxes to the Jewish state. And remember, Palestinians are 20% of Israel's population within the 1967 borders. Now, I was familiar with the promises made in the Israeli Declaration of Independence that said that the new Jewish state would ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants. Well, it was clear from Susan and Samuel that the Palestinians in Israel were still waiting. Despite the stated intentions of 1948, every aspect of Israeli-Palestinian life is disadvantaged compared to their Jewish neighbours. Susan and Samuel had plenty of first-hand experience to prove it. Education resources are consistently lower for Arab schools compared to Jewish schools. Central government funding to develop and improve Palestinian neighbourhoods is vastly less than that for Jewish towns and neighbourhoods. And then there are the marriage laws that stop an Israeli-Palestinian living with their partner if they're from the West Bank. There are land laws that stop Palestinian Israelis from purchasing state land, which is the, most, uh, the majority of land in Israel, held in trust by a government agency for the benefit of the Jewish people exclusively. And I mean for Jews worldwide, not just the Jewish citizens of Israel. And alongside the institutional and legislative discrimination was the casual racism that pervades Israeli society and culture. Palestinians are the perennial other in Israel. They are at best tolerated and at worst seen as a fifth column, the enemy within. And of course I, as a Jew, could choose to become an Israeli citizen tomorrow. Uh, and would be welcomed, at least until they started reading my blog. <laughs> the relatives of Susan and Samuel, pushed out of Palestine in 1948, uh, had no such rights under Israeli law. So it was standing outside of Susan and Samuel's church in Nazareth. That, uh, that was the moment when I took the next step in my journey. That was the moment when I knew I'd finally had it with the whole Zionist project, as it had played itself out over more than 120 years. The problem was not 1967 and the occupied territories. It wasn't even 1948 and the Palestinian Nakba. Nor was the problem Benjamin Netanyahu or any other particular Israeli leader. The problem was the entire Zionist project that was fatally flawed from its 19th century outset. It was standing on the steps of a church in Nazareth. That's when something clicked into place and the last rags of my ultra-liberal Zionism fell to the ground. Zionism has failed to answer the problem uh, of the Jewish condition in Europe in the 19th century. We were neither safe nor secure in this promised land. But worse still, our liberation had been won at the cost of another people's enslavement. And now there are new questions for the Jewish people to confront and deal with. We have become colonisers occupiers, besiegers, annexers, and if we're not doing it directly, we are defending it, or staying silent, or perhaps simply in denial. Now, I'm singling out Israel for my particular 
attention and criticism, not because I think Israel is the worst or the most evil state in the world, um, it isn't. Um, I'm singling it out precisely because I am Jewish and these things have happened and continue to happen in the name of the Jewish people around the world. That doesn't mean I want all Jews to leave Israel and hand the whole place back. Okay? I don't think that's an option. The 8 million Jews who live in Israel are citizens of that country. Most of them have no other home, apart from perhaps some of those uh, US settlers on the West Bank who've kept their American passports. I also want Palestine to be free from the river to the sea, but that can't possibly mean a Palestine free of Jews. You'll never resolve one injustice by creating another. There is no turning the clock back. There is no perfect justice for either side now. Palestinians and Jews will both be part of the future landscape. The only question is, will their relationship be as equals or will it continue to be as it is now, as oppressed and oppressor? When I got home from that 2011 trip, um, I looked more closely at the behavior of the Jewish communal leadership in Britain. Uh, what I realized was that there was never any serious public pressure on Israel from the Jewish community here, and never attempt, no attempt to prepare Jews here for the obvious compromises involved in making a two-state solution, uh, a two-state solution with a Palestinian state worthy of the name, a reality. When did the British chief rabbi, either Jonathan Sachs or now Ephraim Mervis, ever question Israel's wisdom of describing Jerusalem as the eternal, indivisible capital of the Jewish people? When did a president of the Board of Deputies ever call out the daily inhumanity of the occupation? By parroting peace and two states, but avoiding all commentary on the current situation, our Jewish leadership in Britain has kicked every moral consideration down the road and into the long grass. Why worry about today's land and water theft? Why be concerned about the pauperisation of Palestinian farmers or arrests without charge or children in prison? All will be resolved when the moon and the stars are finally aligned and the requirements of Jewish security are satisfied beyond all possible doubt. So that means sometime never. This is the Jewish diaspora contribution to the failure of the peace process for the last quarter of a century. We have collectively abdicated our moral responsibility because it's become politically and religiously impossible for Jews wanting to maintain a mainstream Jewish acceptance and affiliation to effectively criticize Israel in any fundamental way. Support for Israel and more importantly Zionism itself has become a touchstone of Jewish fidelity. And this is true for Jews and for non-Jews. Cross this line and you are in real trouble. But the truth of the matter is, the Jewish community can no longer define Zionism, or indeed anti-Semitism, without the help of Palestinians. For more than a hundred years now, the history of the Palestinians and the Jews has been inextricably linked. Neither of us can understand our past or present condition without reference to the other. Neither people's story is now complete without the other. It's this entanglement of narratives and the need to defend Israel's legitimacy that has led to the muddle, the confusion and the deliberate politicization of anti-Semitism as a concept. And by contrast, it's led to the spiritualization of Zionism, so it has become not politics, but an expression of Jewish faith. All of this has forfeited our right to independently define our Jewish oppression without consulting the victims of our new faith in Jewish nationalism. The meaning of anti-Semitism and Zionism is no longer ours to determine alone. These words, and most importantly the experiences they bring with them, now belong to the Palestinian people too. To get beyond this, we as a Jewish community need to confront Zionism's past and its present. We need to rethink Jewish security in a post-Holocaust, post-Zionist world. We need to build coalitions to tackle all forms of discrimination, solidarity with all those who are othered by those who usually don't even realise there's a problem. That must include anti-Semitism from the left and more often the right, which uses anti-Jewish myths and prejudices to promote hatred of Jews. 
Above all, though, if we want to be serious rather than just tribal about a fair de definition of Zionism, we need to ask the Palestinian people what they think and believe and feel about it. And if they tell us that Zionism is a racist endeavour, then we'd better pay attention. Uh, now, I'm afraid I've not written a positive, uplifting, heroic ending for this talk. Now, that's because I don't see anything remotely uplifting about the situation now or indeed in the foreseeable future. Neither a two-state solution worthy of the name nor a truly democratic one-state solution looks at all likely as things stand. Now, all I'm confident about is that we should expect more of the same. The occupation will continue, the settlements will grow, the Gaza siege will go on, Palestinians will be pushed out of East Jerusalem, refugees will not be allowed to return to their ancestral home. However, there are changing trends that we should be alert to, some of them positive, but some of them worrying. On the positive side, from my perspective in particular, you can see a generational divide opening up within America's Jewish community over support for Israel. Jews under 40 feel distinctly uncomfortable with what Israel has done and continues to do, and you saw that on display in Pittsburgh in the last week with some of the alternative Jewish vigils and the demonstrations that went on when Donald Trump arrived uh, in the city. On the downside, Israel's global trade is growing well beyond Europe and North America. India, China and even Saudi Arabia are opening up to buying Israeli surveillance equipment, battle-tested military hardware and pharmaceuticals. This will alter the geopolitical uh, dynamics of the region, but not in the Palestinians' favour. Trade with the UK is growing too and will continue to grow in a post-Brexit Britain. Uh, unless Corbyn wins the next election. The desperation for tangible Brexit benefits is why Prince William made the royal family's first official trip to Israel this summer. So what's to be done? Well, don't allow the Board of Deputies, <coughs> the Home Office, or even the Church of England to dictate what is or is not acceptable Palestinian solidarity. When that happens, you need to challenge it. I would suggest that you support cultural and commercial boycotts in support of the Palestinian people because that's what the Palestinian people have asked the world to do. If you're part of a church or any organisation which invests in stocks and shares, make sure you're investing responsibly and not rewarding businesses that profit from the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land. Because history tells us that nations never give up power over others voluntarily. Israel will never change while it pays no price for its behaviour. From my own point of view, I will continue to speak out from the Jewish edge because I believe real change in Jewish attitudes will only emerge from the Jewish margins. I'll continue to hold to account the Jewish leadership, a leadership that's lost its way. And by speaking out, I hope to widen the parameters of permissible speech. As I said at the beginning, our relationship with the Palestinian people is the single most important relationship facing Jews and indeed Judaism in this century. The cause of Palestinian freedom cannot only be a Palestinian cause or a Muslim cause or a Christian cause or a liberal humanitarian cause or a left-wing cause. It has to be a Jewish cause too. And when things look bleak, uh, and they do look bleak right now, it's even more important to decide where you are going to stand and who you are going to stand alongside. Thank you for listening.